So hello everyone, my name is Nicole Neiman and I am the clinical research coordinator here in the IBD Center at Stanford. Thank you to everyone for joining tonight to celebrate World IB Day with our wonderful guests. Um, we have Sydney Morgan. She was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis when she was in 2018 when she was 16 and um, ended up getting a total colectomy. She is currently a social media influencer and uses her platform to educate and spread awareness about IBD. We have Ryan Van Voorhis, who was diagnosed with Crohn's disease in high school, ended up also getting his colon removed. And he was a um, social worker and therapist to help others um, with their health and mental health. And um, basically went into that job due, from, due to the people he met with his own health care. And then ended up get, having a career transition and is currently with New Dude Food. And he is the founder of New Dude Food. And that's a private chef business in based out of Chicago. Then we have Dr. Nicole Glenn. She is from the Bay Area. She was also diagnosed with ulcerative colitis when she was 11. And um, she grew up in Bay Area, went to college, um, ended up going to medical school. A lot of that being due to her experiences with IBD um, growing up. And she is a pediatrician and some of her interests are caring for children with disabilities and special needs. And um, we're very lucky to have them. Um, if you're wondering why myself, a clinical research coordinator is hosting this event, I have ulcerative colitis myself. And I think um, growing up with other siblings with ulcerative colitis and just knowing that it's really nice to hear some positive patient stories and examples of resiliency, resiliency to help you think about your future goals is helpful. So we're hoping to invite um, inspiring speakers to our center to share their experiences and to inspire our patients and families and families who may not belong to Stanford, but are here tonight to be with us. Okay, so the way the event will be kind of structured, I'm gonna ask different kinds of questions. Um, I'll start with like having everyone share that their diagnosis story, anything they wanna share about themselves. And um, you are free to put questions in the Q&A and in the chat. Um, our panelists can either answer them live or um, we can um, answer them in the chat or Q&A questions. And so with that, we'll get started. So, um, can you share your diagnosis story? Anyone can start first. I'll go. So uh, how long did it take for you to be diagnosed after symptoms? So I was probably having symptoms for four or five months before I finally told someone because obviously the symptoms are very embarrassing. And I was 16 years old at the time. And like, I didn't want to talk about like going to the bathroom to anyone. And it's so crazy because now like that's a conversation I have constantly with my doctor and I'm so comfortable with that now. And I share my stories on social media and everything. And so I was diagnosed probably four or five months after experiencing my first symptoms. And before I was diagnosed, I had never heard of Crohn's colitis, IBD, nothing. I've never heard of it because people are just, they really keep it to themselves. I guess it's because the symptoms are embarrassing and there's just a stigma around that. So that's why I really use my platform to be an advocate and talk about it because I wanna be that person that I didn't have when I was being diagnosed. And how did I react when I was diagnosed? So it's as far as I knew, you go to the doctor, they tell you what's wrong, they give you medicine, and you're, cure and you're cured. So for them to tell me that this is an ongoing thing and it's a chronic illness and you're going to be dealing with this for the rest of your life, that was a big shock for me. And so it was really hard, that initial shock, to get over that. But after having kind of the information and doing my own research, I realized that this is something that you can get into remission and you're not going to be in pain forever. So that's kind of my diagnosis story. I'm happy to. I'm happy to share. Um, so I was diagnosed when I was uh, 11 or 12. I was in fifth grade. Um, so some of the details I don't exactly remember, like how long. I think it took a few months. Um, I remember being told, you know, my parents were taking me to pediatricians, and my stomach was hurting all the time, and um, maybe I had some sort of infection. They didn't know what was wrong. Um, so it took a while, um, but eventually we landed at a good pediatrician and through the children's hospital got diagnosed. Um, I had never heard of it. I had no clue. I just realized my parents were really upset. Um, and I kind of remember saying like, stop freaking out. It's fine. I'm going to be okay. 
um, because I don't think I understood what was really going on um, and was just trying to stay calm for my parents who I think really struggled. Um, I didn't know anyone, had never heard of it. Um, and I, I just remember feeling frustrated that everyone was talking around me and not to me. And I do remember that being like, hey, I'm the patient. I want to know what's going on. Like, you need to talk to me about what's happening. But I was young, you know, 11 is, you know, young. Um, so uh, I think it sunk in later. And it, especially once we started talking about treatment, I was, you know, at 11, the thing I was the most worried about was the steroids and like having a puffy face and, you know, how it would make me look, which is, seems so silly now kind of thinking back, but it was such a big deal to me at that age. Um, and I was more worried about that than, than anything. Um, and so, uh, you know, for me, it's been a big change between as an 11 year old to now a 32 year old mother, 37, oh, 32, 37. <laughs> I wish I was still 32. Um, so a lot's changed. Um, and so the things I think about and worry about are very different than it was when I was 11. Um, and that's, you know, I'm sure a lot of people's journeys, depending on the age you were at diagnosis. Yeah, similar for me. I was, um, I guess I wasn't diagnosed until I was about 16, but the process started probably when I was closer to 14. Um, I guess I'm the oldest in the room. I'm, I'm going to be 40 this year. So way back when, uh, when I was 14 and uh, just starting high school, you know, the, the prime of your adolescence, I, I was having all of these digestive GI problems uh, and, and no one really knew what was going on. So uh, I, I grew up in a smaller town. I'm in Chicago now, uh, but in my smaller town, going to pediatricians and doctors, um, they really didn't know exactly what it was, you know, when they started doing colonoscopies and preps and all the scans, uh, and all, drinking all the, the nasty stuff way back when, but it took almost two years to actually get a, 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 a positive diagnosis of Crohn's disease. Um, all the while just having a, a really, really horrible experience. Cause again, yeah, the first thing they put me on was steroids. So all the puffy face, moon face stuff, again, as I'm uh, a sophomore, you know, freshman, sophomore in high school. Um, and at the time, yeah, I, I didn't know anyone with it. I mean, my doctors barely knew that much about it, even at the time themselves. So very uh, isolating, uh, not only for myself, but my, my family, you know, they were great support system, even back then day one, uh, but, you know, felt com com completely kind of helpless because, you know, they couldn't take my pain away or help me uh, other than taking me to procedures and doctor's appointments. So uh, way back when early diagnosis at a, as a, an adolescent age, you know, was probably one of the hardest times uh, in, of my life, uh, especially not having a support system outside of my own family uh, where I could talk with someone who had IBD or had some similar experiences. Uh, so uh, again, how did I react? I mean, uh, you know, I was, I was confused. I didn't know what I did wrong or what was wrong with me and my parents, you know, they had a lot of guilt and, and blame on themselves for, you know, you know, they birthed me, but who, who knows, maybe something in their history or their genetics, they thought maybe they passed this on to me. Uh, so for us, it was uh, a really tough couple years uh, in that initial diagnosis phase. Um, uh, but here we are today, and I, I've never been better. And as the uh, presentation goes on, you hear about my story and, and the rest of the panel's story. So uh, very tough diagnosis, but thriving and doing really well today. Thank you, everyone, for sharing. And for those watching, I'm sure you can all relate at some level with everyone's diagnosis story. Okay, so for the next question, it's going to be about like medications and treatments or surgeries that you've had throughout your IBD. And again, this is just kind of people who have IBD are always curious about what has someone else tried, what hasn't worked for them. And so we're just curious to hear about what's been your journey with medications, if you remember them from the very beginning, um, or different treatments that you've tried, and also like how they've affect, how different medications or treatments have affected um, your quality of life in different ways. I will start this one, I guess, maybe. Um, to keep it relatively short, I feel like I've tried everything uh, under the sun, medication-wise, treatment-wise, uh, and, and for me, again, maybe just because it was so hard to diagnose and affected so much of my uh, GI system, 
uh, nothing really seemed to work. I, I was hospitalized many times for uh, reactions to the medication. So not only did it not help my Crohn's, but it gave me pancreatitis. I remember trying uh, Remicade infusion once and it worked really well. Uh, the next treatment, uh, once they started the infusion, I went into anaphylactic shock and almost stopped breathing. Um, so all in all, my total experience with all the medications is kind of part of my journey with Crohn's, you know, not only just the, the trauma of having the physical symptoms and, and mental, you know, side effects from, you know, having this disease, but also, you know, just, you know, being hospitalized and going through the trials and tribulations of trying new medications, whether they're in, you know, their uh, trials themselves, you know, you're really willing to try anything at that point as a patient to, to feel better. Uh, and unfortunately, or fortunately for me, by the time I was a junior in college, so it's about six years of medication management and trying new things. Uh, finally, I went up to the Mayo Clinic, uh, where I finally was, uh, got a, the doctors really got a good look and they saw my colon and they were like, you know, if you don't have a, uh, you know, surgery to remove your colon, and have a permanent ostomy, you, you will have no quality of life. You know, there, it was irreversible, the damage that the Crohn's disease had done for my, uh, system over those years. So, um, yeah, I, you know, that was kind of the end of my medication journey, because once I had my ostomy surgery, uh, there was some tinkering here and there were some minor medications. Uh, really, for me, moving forward, it was, it was diet related that really helped me get off all medications. Uh, and then obviously the big one having you know my colon, which was completely useless at that point, removed. Um, so yeah, that is my experience with medication and surgeries. Yeah, kind of going off of that, I, I feel like I had a similar path with trying every medication under the sun. I was just burning through them because nothing was helping me at all other than the prednisone, which obviously you can't be on that long term. And the side effects were horrendous. We can all agree on that. And I, there were times when I would tell my doctor, I'm like, I'm, I'm not taking it. I can't do it anymore. So I would like refuse my steroids, which, you know, I probably wasn't good either. And I did all different infusion medications. The Remicade helped me probably the longest out of every medication, but that was only about three months maybe. And I was still kind of having symptoms, but um, I did, I was dairy-free and gluten-free and I think that helped me. I don't know. And uh, surgeries, I ended up getting my colon removed in October of 2019. And I was diagnosed in August of 2018. So it was a really quick journey of trying these medications until they removed my colon because I went in for a colonoscopy and they could not even do it because fear of tearing the colon. So it was kind of emergency surgery to remove this, this colon that was not doing anything for me anymore. And I had my ostomy from October until COVID. Actually, I was supposed to get my first J pouch surgery right when uh, in March or April. And because of COVID, they stopped doing all non-emergency surgeries. So I kind of got pushed away until June. I had my first J pouch surgery. And then just this September, I got my ostomy taken down and I've, doing, I've been doing great ever since. So... Um, my experience has, has been pretty different. I, I will um, say I have been fortunate to have relatively mild disease, um, mild-ish. Um, so mostly have been managed with mesalamine-based medications and did that when I was a kid. There was, you know, trying different things, um, you know, sulfa drugs I was allergic to, and steroids was the mainstay. I mean, definitely it was mesalamine and steroids, mesalamine and steroids. And, um, you know, and I think throughout my sort of teenage years, things kind of would get better and worse and better and worse. And so sometimes I would have years where things were really great and then where they weren't so wonderful. Um, and there would get talk about ex escalation and then I would luckily kind of get better um, before. I think the worst, um, especially as I got on my own, I think my parents really kind of forced me to make sure I was taking my medication and everything was, is easier when I was younger and then college, med school, when I was more on my own and maybe wasn't always the greatest about staying on top of things is where um, things would escalate and we would talk about adding in biologics and 
I got really lucky. And so we never got to that point. Um, so um, I think, uh, you know, we haven't, I haven't had to have the conversations about surgery, although that was always something that was kind of in the back of my mind and, and something that I think probably most people think about all the time. So um, the thing that I struggled with um, and, may, and I'm sure everybody can relate is one of the best treatments that really helped my symptoms. I had a lot of lower disease. And so suppositories and, and um, enemas worked great, but I hated using them. Didn't want to, didn't want to talk about it. You know, even like later was like, nope. And so, and that was, it was unfortunate that I took that sort of thought process, but um, they're helpful. And it took me a while to realize like this was something I need to do and can really prevent flares. And if I would, you know, realize that even though it's awkward to think about, this is my body and I need to take care of it. And, and this makes me, sort of get things better quickly before they escalate to something where I'm on Eucerus or some type of steroid-based medication again, you know, um, especially as I started getting towards the age of having kids, I really, I think that's when it became more real for me that I had to try to be diligent about taking care of myself. I didn't, I wanted to try to stay off of biologic medications if I could, um, you know, as I was going to have kids. Um, and then even thinking about that, you know, now that I'm on the other side of it, I have had the pleasure of taking care of children whose parents, whose mothers had IBD and were on biologics and these kids are doing beautifully. So I think that fear that I had of like, I can't be on biologic medications if I'm going to have children, I know is not true. I, I, I see the, I've seen, I take care of lots of kids whose moms took Remicade and Humira and things like that. And they're doing great. So, um, you know, I think trying to trust the doctors is, was hard and making in the medications, like you all have said, the side effects were hard and making sure that, you know, we try to do what's best for our bodies isn't always easy. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sure like everyone can relate with one of the medications or treatments that all of you have been on and the same experiences with steroids, I think is shared by many who have been on them or just know what it does to them from hearing other people's. IBD stories and prednisone. So how has IBD most impacted your physical or mental health? Also like how has it have impacted your body image over time? Yeah, body image was something I struggled with a lot due to the side effects of the medicine because when I was on high doses of steroids, I was gaining a bunch of weight, my face was swelling up and it was like, how do you explain that to people that, you know, you, you see around school, they just think like, oh, she's gaining weight, all this, that, and that's constantly what I was thinking about. I was like, everyone's looking at me and I would not get in any photos from when I was on steroids. There's no photos of me. I would not wear my hair in a ponytail. I would wear it down to cover my face. And I was really like ashamed and I just felt uncomfortable in my body. And it's really sad because there was nothing I could do about it because being on those steroids is something you had to do. And it was something that would ultimately help me feel better. So that was really hard for me to accept. And then on the other hand, sometimes I would be flaring so bad that I was losing all kinds of weight and I looked like a skeleton. So I just think the drastic changes from that was happening so quickly. And so I was seeing my body like vastly change from one to the next. And it was really hard for me to kind of cope with that. And um, yeah, that's I, that really affected my mental health. And getting over that has been rough. And that's something that I continue to work on and to advocate about because I've had such an experience with that. So I post lots of photos of myself that I have from those different stages and just try to tell people that it's all right and you're going to get through it and it's not going to last forever. Cindy, I have a follow-up question for you. So since you were basically diagnosed in like August, 2018, and then it was like 14 months later, you had your surgery. So it was just like so much like change with your disease in that time. Did your, like, did you have, like, were you telling your friends at that time about like what was going on and the people that were close to you? Just cause obviously there's lots of physical change, like it's an invisible disease, but mm -hmm. for you is starting to be more visible to others and like how you, um, how that affected your, I guess, um, social health. Yeah, so I very strongly believe in and I encourage others to talk about their disease because in my opinion, it would put a lot more stress on me if I had to like cover up why I couldn't go places, why all these 
changes were happening to me. I just feel like that would be so much harder to like make stuff up all the time. So if you're just honest with your friends and your family about what's going on, then I feel like they're going to be a lot more understanding with what you're going through and why you can't go to certain places in certain situations. So it really helped me to be completely honest with my friends. And like I said, I'd never heard of it before I was diagnosed. So I wanted to help educate other people. And I kind of thought it was cool that I had this thing going on that no one's heard about. And then I could show up to school after I was at the doctor. And I'm like, hey, guys, guess what? And then I would just spit some IBD facts to them. And so that's kind of how I coped with it is I loved to talk about it to people, surprisingly enough. Um, and so I think, you know, for me, um, like I said, I was, I think I was pretty fortunate in that the symptoms weren't super, super severe. Um, I think the biggest issue I had was, um, stress in terms of trying to make sure that, uh, I was kind of addressing when things would get rough. So, you know, I had to try to make sure I was getting enough rest and trying to make sure I was eating okay, which can be tough when you're you know, going through, a, you know, you're a high school student and then your college student and, you know, residency, med school, that was, that was hard. So I think um, trying to find a balance between wanting to be a typical sort of teenager and young adult and go do all the things I'm supposed to do versus making sure I'm taking care of myself was a hard balance to strike. Um, and then, cause I would pay for it. If I took care of myself, I would be all right, but otherwise just sort of more fatigue and, and stomach pain and, to manage um, responsibilities when you're like, oh, I feel like I need to run to the restroom immediately, but I have to, I'm taking care of patients or I'm doing whatever. And so I think that was hard, that kind of urgency and sometimes feeling like I don't have a minute to go take care of what I need to do when I'm trying to live my life. So um, I think that that part was hard. Um, mentally, I think uh, it, I think I did okay with it. I think same way with Sydney. I, I was generally wanting to talk about it. And I think that that helped a lot. I think, especially as I got older, I didn't talk about it when I was 11, but I think as I hit high school and hit college, the more open I was with people about it, the easier it was to deal with. And I didn't feel like I had to explain anything. I could just go do what I needed to do. If we were somewhere and I was in the restroom for a while, no one questioned. It wasn't a thing. It was fine. Cause everyone was like, Oh, you know, everyone loved me for who I was and just understood that that was part of my life. And so it didn't feel like something I had to hide. And that was very liberating. Um, and I think the more comfortable I get every year with my diagnosis and my life, and the more I share, the more it doesn't feel like anything I need to hide or want to hide and feel like, you know, I wish that kids and young adults didn't feel like they had to do that. Because I think that really makes the impact on your physical and mental health so much worse when you feel like you're hiding it. For sure. Yeah, I uh, agree with both uh, Dr. Nicole and Sydney. You both said, you know, about just the um, the the ups and downs of, of steroids and just how, uh, you know, those high school years, you know, for me as well, just were were horrible, you know, my, my self-esteem, my, you know, um, my confidence as a 15 year old male in a, in a high school setting and the, the balloon face or moon face, um, you know, I, I missed out on, you know, I, high school sports, I, I tried out and I was on uh, the, the soccer team in high school, but just due to some of the medications that had, had, had weakened my, um, my bones, uh, my, my bone density, uh, so I ended up not being able to be as active as I wanted to at that time. Um, and then obviously physically having an ostomy at 18 and being told by doctors, um, you know, you have no choice. If you want your quality of life to get better, this is what needs to happen. So uh, being told that was, it was extremely hard to hear, but also uh, not really given a choice of, you know, prolonging procedures and trying other medication was a good thing as an 18 year old, cause I didn't want to have to weigh those options uh, as a, as a, you know, a late teenager. So for me though, having that surgery and now I've had an ostomy for over 20 years, I've had an ostomy longer now that I've been without one. Uh, I almost can't imagine what it would be like without it now. I mean, do I, you know, if there was a magic wand and a, a, a magic procedure that I could do without it at this point? Yes. But um the, how I feel now and how, um, 
you know, how I treat my body and how physically active I am now. Uh, at almost 40, I'm in better shape and more active now than I was when I was 20. So I, again, I, you know, in this, the title of this Zoom is success story. So I really want to focus on the positives. I really, uh, I mean, none of us would be here if we didn't have IBD, but through those physical and mental kind of, you know, changes and difficulties that really kind of, you know, tested kind of who we were as people. And, and I'm a big proponent of, you know, it's really cliche, but what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So, um, you know, what I've dealt with in my life uh, as physically, you know, taxing and difficult it has been, you know, numerous long hospitalizations, you know, month long recoveries, you know, but for me, um, you know, I, I've, I've turned it into a positive and looked at it mentally as a positive because, you know, I, I've overcome all these things in my life and then it makes, you know, day-to-day -day stressors not as rough. So, oh, you know, a, a bad weather or, you know, a stressful day at work or traffic jams, things like that, you know, in, in the, the grand scheme of things, it's really a, a drop in the bucket compared to what we all have overcome uh, in our lives through dealing with Crohn's and IBD. Uh, that being said, mentally, um, when I was young and first diagnosed, I really didn't have many people at all to talk to outside of uh, GI doctors. I had no um, support system with my peers. Um, so at an early age, thankfully, uh, I started seeing a, a counselor just to have someone other than my parents and doctors to talk to. Um, you know, it really wasn't anything like profound that I learned through therapy way back when, but just the value of talking to someone uh, and being supported uh, really shaped my uh, prognosis and my outlook, not only on life, but just with, with the disease. Uh, so, you know, flash forward to college and then grad school, I, I really wanted to give back in any way I could. So I uh, started pursuing a career in social work and then got my master's and a license um, because those early years that I, I was, again, a teenager going through this life-changing uh, diagnosis and disease, it's through those uh, supportive figures in my life that, you know, not only, you know, gave me quality of life back, but also changed my life that I wanted to do that with myself and give back in any way I could because I had such a positive, uh, they had such a positive effect on, on my outlook as well. Thank you. Um, and then just before moving on to the next question, I just wanted to ask the question out loud that was put into the Q&A, um, so directed towards Dr. Glenn. Um, so any tips on how to help kids um, take their rectal medications and um, so, so like suppositories, enemas for people who are unfamiliar with what that may be, and uh, especially when they're very reluctant. That's tough. I mean, I, I was a reluctant teen and I remember that I was probably in a, a reluctant 20 year old, <laughs> maybe even a reluctant 30 year old. So um, I, I think, I mean, with a lot of times, sometimes the more we, the more we try to push, the more kids will push back. I mean, I think we all know that. And I think sometimes trying to understand what it is that makes us uncomfortable about it. Is it physically that you, you know, is it the embarrassment? What is, what is it that is the barrier and how do we try to get through that? Is it that you don't want to talk about it, that you'll do it and it's just, I need to not be on you about it because it's not fun to ask your, have your mom ask you, did you take your rectal medication today? Like, look, so is it, you know, that there needs to be some independence there or is it, you know, um, timing or is it you know that you just don't like the way you feel with it and trying to understand where the barrier is um, and even if you do understand you know you have to give people time to want to do things so I think you know trying to give people a little give your kids a little bit of grace to sort of feel what they feel and talk and if they want to talk about it let them talk about it I think the other thing is trying to help see what the alternative is, right? It's like, well, these are helpful meds. And if they don't work, then we may have to move on to this other thing, which may have these other side effects. So I think especially for kids who don't want to end up on steroids or don't want to do Remicade infusions or, you know, whatever, sometimes it's like, okay, this is the lesser of the two evils. Like at least this will keep me maybe doing what I want to do. And then, and then I think 
so there's a technique we use in medicine called motivational interviewing, and it's kind of helping um, to figure out like what's your goals, what are you motivating, and, that, and then seeing how the things you do in your life can help you get there. So I think instead of focusing on like you're not doing this, it's like, okay, where do I want to be? And so then is there a way I could get there? And does this help me get there or not? I don't know if anyone else has anything else they want to add. I mean, I would agree with that. I just think you just have to make sure they're understanding that it could help them. It'll make them feel better if they at least give it a try before they move on. And like you said, it could be the lesser of the two evils if you don't want to be on steroids or other infusions and things like that. So. And then another question before, um, I see one question in the Q&A and I'll say that one for later since we have a slide dedicated to that. But the one in the chat, um, have you felt any, have any of you felt that the diet changed your symptoms? And so I know, or like just talk about diet and lifestyle, um, how that might have affected your symptoms over time. I mean, for me, um, now I, you know, I started a business about, you know, cooking healthy foods and, and private chef business. But uh, so yes, the, the short answer, yes, food and diet uh, are extremely important for, um, you know, managing your symptoms with Crohn's and colitis. Uh, oddly enough, way back when, uh, when I was diagnosed and going through uh, all of my procedures and whatnot, I don't ever remember uh, seeing uh, a nutritionist or a dietitian. No one ever mentioned uh, any diet changes to me or, you know, all, you know, FODMAP or all these things. Now that, uh, again, that being said, this was, uh, I don't know, I was 14, 15 and probably like the early 90s. So again, now uh, for hopefully, you know, a lot of the people on the uh, Zoom, uh, their, the, uh, you know, your mental health and physical health, but also just your diet and how uh, it affects your GI system. Because again, for me, it was just meds, meds, meds. Uh, but now as, as things, as we know more, obviously about uh, Crohn's and colitis, and of course, naturally how not only stress, but how our uh, digestion, digestion and foods that we put in our body, uh, of course, they would have a, a very close correlation. And then um, another question, what diet works best? Um, for that one, every person with Crohn's or UC is unique and every diet is going to work differently for everyone else. And so there's really not one diet that works best um because you might be different than someone who worked how to diet work very well for them and then um the question about uh experiences with ibd and wanting to go to medical school i'll save that one too for later okay and then um, I know this was earlier touched on too about how you coped um, with missing out on certain experiences due to IBD. So if there's anything like you want to share, especially for like younger kids um, with like school and um, like missing out on birthday parties or missing out on different like just school, school in general, but how you cope with that and what tips you have um, for others. Or now in your current lives, um, yeah, I mean, when you I, have I, to I miss mean, out on certain things, how do you cope with that? Yeah, I mean, I, I remember way back when missing out on so much, um, you know, but it's been so long now that I don't need, I, I can't, I can't think of anything specific that was like life changing that now in my day, I'm still like, I'm still angry, you know, 20 years later, I missed out on something or whatever it is, a practice or a team, you know, even not being on like, uh, high school sports, you know, or in the grand scheme of things, you know, it's easy to look back and be like, you know, you know, it, it's, it really didn't make that big a difference because really my health was the biggest concern. And so if I wasn't healthy to do some of these activities or, you know, when I, uh, when I found out I needed to have an ostomy surgery, I was, it was my spring break. It was my junior year of spring break. I could have been probably on a beach somewhere doing things I shouldn't have. But again, you know, it was, a blessing in disguise because I ended up having, um, you know, you know, a, not a great time, you know, at the doctors or the hospital, but it, it, it got me on a track that without that, I it would have delayed my health coming kind of back to me. So um, focusing on the positives and, you know, not letting your disease define you and, and be defined by 
you know, a collection of events that you missed out on in your, you know, earlier years when you're being diagnosed and, and really just having a positive outlook on, on being uh, excited and thankful for the opportunities and, and the memories that you can create once you're healthy enough to do uh, said activities and, and get back in there uh, or something that, you know, kind of keep me motivated and going forward. Yeah, yeah I know. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, you know, similarly, I don't, I don't, I can't actually think of specific things I missed out on, although I'm sure that there were. And if you think about it, especially if they're younger kids, you know, no matter what in your life happens, you may miss something, you know, you break an arm the week before your family vacation to the beach, or you get sick on holiday. I mean, it happens, right? And, and I think, um, obviously, if you have a chronic illness, it's going to happen way more. And that is, is hard on kids. And I think, looking back, I like, it's sort of what Ryan said, it's like, it maybe didn't make a big deal in the grand scheme of things, but at the time it did mean a lot. And so I think I would at least advise that we don't minimize that for kids like that or teens, you know, if you're missing out on something that stinks. And I think that they should feel validated and feeling like it does, it is a bummer, even if it as an adult doesn't seem like it's not that big of a deal, because it matters a lot at that age. I, I think more funny, the one thing I do remember not being able to do and being kind of frustrated about was um, I couldn't get a job after I took a gap year in between college and med school and I wanted to get a job uh, I went to school in Colorado and a lot of my friends wanted to be um, work at this at the slopes they wanted to be lifties um, and that isn't that's not a job that comes with health insurance and my parents were older so I lost my insurance through them in college so I had to find a job that had health insurance because I had to have health insurance as soon as I graduated. It wasn't an option. And my friends were not thinking about these type of things. And so um, over that as always, and I remember feeling like, oh, I can't, I can't go just do this like whatever job because I need to find something that actually offers healthcare. Um, and I remember thinking that was a big deal at the time, but it was just reality. And I moved on and figured something else out. And looking back at like Ryan's, it doesn't, it doesn't make a difference now. And maybe, um, but at the time, I think it, it was a big deal. And so, again, I just think you have to validate those feelings and then try to focus on the positive, what you can do, what things you, um, what other options there are. You know, it always feels like it's the end of the world at first. And then you can usually realize there's another opportunity there, something else that you can take part of and that it doesn't need to define you. And traveling was another big one for me. I, I really wanted to travel and had to be really thoughtful about where I was going am I in good enough health to go? You know, what kind of medical access do I have in these countries? I, I spent a month doing a medical rotation in Honduras um, and was pretty nervous before I went because I knew I was going to be in a really rural area. And so thinking, really just planning in advance, contingency planning, what am I going to do if I get sick? Who am I going to call? What kind of access do I have? So just things like that, I, I do feel like everything took a little more thought in trying to figure out, can I really do this safely? Um, and I think because I was an adult when I did those things, it was a little easier to do than, you know, obviously when you're younger, that's a little more challenging. And yeah, so I struggled with this a lot and it's a lot more recent for me because I just graduated in 2020. And so after my diagnosis, until I got my ostomy, I pretty much didn't go to school because my symptoms were so bad because I couldn't find any medicine that would give me into remission. And I just remember this felt like the end of the world. I would cry about not being able to go to things and I would be like, why me? And so some tips that I would have is if you, if you're, if you told your friends you can't go somewhere, stay off of social media. Cause I would go on social media and w look at their stories of them having so much fun and I would just make myself sad. So that's completely irrelevant. You don't need to look at it. You don't need to know what they're doing. So I would say stay off of social media. And I would say get a hobby that you can do from home. For me, I'm an artist and I'm also a makeup artist. So I was drawing and painting and reading and doing things that I enjoy and things that I could do to be productive from home. And also if I wanted to see my friends, then I would get a couple of my closest friends that knew everything that was going on with me and I would have them over to my house because that's where I was the most comfortable. And if I had to go to the bathroom, I would just go upstairs and they would continue doing whatever we were doing, watching movie, playing video games, anything like that. So those are some situations and kind of solutions that I've come across in my day. And yeah, I mean, there's always things that you can do. And like you guys said, in the grand scheme of things, it's not the end of the world. Like I, junior year, forced myself to go to prom because I thought prom is this magical day. It is not. 
And it was one of the worst days of my life. I was flaring terribly. I had C. diff. I was at the prom for 20 minutes and then ended up in the hospital the next day. So it really wasn't worth it, but it, I felt like it was going to be the end of the world if I didn't go. So just know that it's okay to say no to going out with your friends and it's not the end of the world. Thank you. I remember I had a teacher in high school that told us to the people like missing prom that it's like, if you think this is going to be the highlight of your life, like, I hope you have something better in five years. And I'm sure yeah. all of you had way better things than prom, like right after, um, and after prom. Yeah. Not that it's not as great as they show in the movies. Um, but thank you very much. Any, does anyone else want to add to this one before we move on for coping? I'm coping. Okay. And then Cindy, I had a follow-up question um, that I thought about. So with your creative outlet with being like a makeup artist, did that kind of start like around the time of like all of your symptoms and like missing school or did you always kind of have that creative outlet and interest? Yeah. So I always say I've been drawing and painting ever since I could pick up a pencil. So it was always something that I enjoyed and I've always had a very creative mind. But definitely my IBD helps me embrace that because it was something that I could do even while I was having symptoms. And I remember after I got my ostomy, I was in the hospital for about two months due to some complications. And I just remember I had probably four or five nurses in my room because there was this palette, this makeup palette launching that I wanted so bad. And so we were all refreshing the site to try and get this makeup palette for me. And we did get it. And I just remember just how happy that would make me. And when I was doing makeup and drawing and painting, it just felt like an escape for me. And it kind of disconnected me from like the symptoms and missing out on things. And it was something that I just genuinely enjoyed. And I'm so happy that I was able to make that into a career and kind of share my art with other people and also my IBD story. So thank you. And then, so I know all of you have touched on this question, but how has your diagnosis and also your life's like post um, surgeries influenced your passions, any education or career goals? Um, this, I'll go, this I think, um, I think having IBD changed a lot for me. And I think it was part of the reason I became a doctor. Um, I, like I said, I remember feeling frustrated that everybody was talking to my parents and kind of not involving me in the conversation and feeling like this is, a, and as I think the kids should be, I want to know what's going on with my body. I want to be part of this. I remember my parents wanted me to do um, some, uh, like, not that this is not great, but at the time they wanted me to go see a different type of doctor, like a holistic or homeopathic doc. And I just, I didn't want to. And I remember being like, I, I don't want to, I don't want to do that. I want to see my doctor and I don't understand why I have to, like, it should be my decision. And so I felt very passionate about working with kids and um, understanding the way it impacts, you know, disease impacts them. And um, just being in the hospital and seeing how things worked, it just, it was like, I want to do this. And so it was a lot of why I chose to become a doc. Um, it, um, and then the choice of specialty, I, I thought I actually wanted to do gastroenterology. I thought really, really hard about it. Um, and I loved being in the GI clinic and I loved doing the GI rotations, but um, it was almost a little bit too much. It, it gave, I was like, I need a little separation in my life. Um, I already have, you know, IBD is every day for me and I need it not to always be my work too. So um, that's why I try, so I decided to do general pediatrics which, um, you know, still I do encounter IBD patients all the time. Um, so it was very inspiring for me to want to give back in that way. I wanted to be an advocate for kids. I wanted to help families. I wanted to connect with them. You know, I remember how hard it was on my parents and I wanted to really focus and practice on medicine as a team. Um, and that's what I love about pediatrics in particular is that my patient's are my kids and the parents and sometimes grandparents and sister and whoever else is there. And so, and I remember the way my illness impacted my whole family. It was probably, I feel like they were more stressed in the beginning than I was. My sister was beside herself and so worried. And so I think that I wanted to make sure that I practice that style of medicine, be having realized how a chronic illness affects the whole family. And so I think that that made a lot of um, impact. And then, um, my career goals have shifted a little bit. My uh, my oldest daughter, who's four and a half, has I've also has a very very rare genetic disorder and is disabled. And so, 
now even more than ever, I, I sort of work with families that are going through really tough things. And I am um, really interested in sort of that aspect as well. So I, um, I love sort of being the, the lead of the team. And that's what I try to see myself as, because I think so often parents need someone to kind of hold their hand through this and, and no matter what their kids are going through. And so it's hard to see your kid diagnosed with something. And, and I think I understand that having been through it. Yeah. After I was diagnosed, I was like, this is, this is it. I'm going to be a GI pediatric doctor because I've just had amazing relationships with all of my doctors and my surgeon who took out my colon actually also had the exact same surgical series and ulcerative colitis. And I really liked that about him because I felt like he could relate exactly to what I was going through. So I thought that if I was a GI doctor and I've been through it, then I have this like profound insight to all my patients. So that's what I was planning on doing. And then um, my graduation year, I figured out that I had to get my surgeries pushed because of COVID. So I was at least going to take a semester off from college. And then after COVID hit, I decided on a gap year. And during this gap year is when I really started um, posting on social media just for fun. And it blew up and my parents were like, okay, this is great. It's a hobby, but you're still going to go to school. And so now I'm lucky enough that I can make this into a career for me. And I don't know if I'm going to go back to school or when, but at the end of the day, school will always be there. And the opportunities that I have now will not always be there. So I think it's in my best interest to pursue what I have going on now. And then maybe I will go back and do something. I don't know. We'll see. I'm just going with the flow. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, definitely influenced my passions and education career, like completely like everyone else has said on the panel. I, uh, yeah, come college, I knew I wanted to give back in some way. So I pursued a, a career in social work and therapy, moved up to Chicago where I had all my surgeries and some like very good doctors. Um, so I became a, a, a child therapist um, but kind of like Dr. Nicole said, I didn't need to be in it 24 seven. So my focus uh, was child abuse and neglect in the inner cities uh, of Chicago, uh, looking back, probably just if not more stressful type of work than dealing with IBD kids and patients, but uh, did that for about 10 to 12 years. Uh, and all the while, um, my passion and creative outlet and stress relief uh, not only fitness, but also uh, cooking was something I really, really dove in, whether I was, um, you know, really burned out at work or not having a good Crohn's day, just kind of diving into the kitchen and, and, and cooking and, and messing around with ingredients from the farmer's market uh, really kind of fueled my passion for, uh, for cooking and healthy eating, but also then mentally kind of helped me feel better about like really tough days at work. Uh, Flash forward, I was getting so burned out in my day job that it also was affecting my uh, physical health and mental health. So I've already had the ostomy, but I'm just dealing with so much stress that it's affecting my Crohn's and, and my day to day uh, that I uh, ended up um, completely making a career change about four years ago. I started a business called New Dude Food, uh, thanks to Instagram, some catchy name and image. Uh, we're a private dining uh, company based out of Chicago. So uh, myself and uh, another cook will come to your house and cook a multi-course meal, uh, all centered around uh, healthy ingredients sourced locally at the farmer's market, things that are in season. Uh, and that was another way that my IBD influenced me because now here, not only did my uh, educational background help me uh, kind of give back, but also now starting a completely new career in brand uh, that I can, uh, you know, it's not completely focused on Crohn's or colitis or IBD at all, uh, but also, um, you know, these are tips and things that I eat and cook for people, whether they have any diagnosis, you know, will help them live a better, healthier lifestyle. So uh, my IBD it completely influenced my education, my career, my passions, uh, but I'm super grateful for it. Out of curiosity, what's the most common dietary request that you receive when you are cooking? Um, oh man, it's 
it changes a lot. Probably like gluten free is a big one, um, which is tough for me. Uh, I mean, it's not it's it's easy to substitute, but my biggest passions are homemade sourdough bread and uh, now sourdough pizza. So I'm constantly around gluten and flour. Thankfully, uh, it doesn't affect me negatively because I'm literally eating it and breathing it all the time. The good thing about our, our, our sourdough bread or like a, it's a long fermentation process. So although there is gluten, it's, it's flour, water, salt in our homemade bread. But, you know, you go to a store and get some bread on the counter and it's 10, 20 ingredients. There's a lot of stabilizers and things that shouldn't be in there. So we found even, um, you know, people with some gluten intolerances can have our bread because of uh, that long fermentation process. But yeah, that's probably the bigger one. The biggest one is, is just the, the gluten-free. Thank you. Okay, and then, um, so the next slide is about balance with IBD, social life, work in academics. And um, if there's basically a, just anything you wanna add, since I know throughout all the questions that we have gone over tonight, we have answered this question in some way. Um, but yeah, see if anyone wants to take a stab at this question. Um, I can go with, um, you know, I've had so many different environments that I kind of had to manage. Um, and I think one of the most important things was sort of, um, being open about what was going on. I think, um, especially thinking about, uh, my residency, um, that, you know, especially about the question about, you know, stress and stress coupled with disease flare, you know, medicine's a stressful career. So, and I, stress was one of the things that affected me the most. I used to, as a younger kid, I used to flare before the start of every school year because I would get nervous about going back to school, which was silly. I mean, and I was excited. I loved, I was a total nerd. I loved school, but I would get nervous and then I would flare up. And so, um, you know, I think, um, especially for residency, I remember I had to talk to my chief residents and say, you know, this, this is, this is my diagnosis. This is what's going on. You know, I, I, I may miss stuff if I have to. And, um, you know, there's a support in place and they were like, yeah, it's okay. And well, that's why we have backup plans and people get sick and things happen. And if you can't pull a shift, you can't do something like we have a way of helping you with that. And I, I never wanted to do that because I felt like it was my responsibility to like attend my rotations. Um, and, and I mostly would, but if I couldn't, I knew I couldn't. And I had to think about this isn't safe for me. This isn't safe for my patients. Like I need, I need the time. And my colleagues and co-residents were happy to fill in for me if I needed it. Um, so I think that that kind of like you, like Sydney and, and Ryan have said, recognizing, you know, sometimes the hiding it is, is worse. And so, um, and sort of now same thing with work. I think as my life has gone on, I've, I've figured out where I have to cut back. Um, I've talked to, um, you know, my leaders at my office about, you know, when I was first working, I was, it was way better than residency, but I was working a lot of hours and it was my big flare. And, you know, I realized I was like, I can't do this. I have to figure out how to to prioritize me and because I chose and I made sure to ch join a group of docs that I thought had that sort of teamwork feel like I wanted to make sure I wasn't in a place where it was everybody out for themselves and you know that, that they would support me and so if I needed to cut back hours I needed to take a, a, a break I needed to drop down from four days a week to three days a week um, that that was going to be okay and so I've managed that way I've had to make adjustments and I've always tried to choose environments where I feel like that will be accepted and not put myself in a situation where I'm not going to have that um, grace, that grace period. Um, so um, that's how I kind of managed um, with school and with work. Yeah, in school, I knew I had a 504 plan. So all my teachers were aware and they were giving me certain accommodations. Like if I had to leave during class to use the restroom or if I wanted to take a test in a different room in case I had to leave and things like that. So they're really understanding and that was great. And I know when I was looking into universities that there's certain accommodations you can have with dorm rooms as well. So you can have like your own private bathroom so you don't have to share one with the floor. And I think that it's just really helpful to keep people aware of what's going on with you. And everyone has been super understanding and willing to work with me. Yeah, I think, you know, the only thing I can, or one thing I can add to that is yeah, the more open you are with your colleagues, your loved ones, 
your school, your work, you know, I, I think uh, not only are you going to just kind of have that stress off relieved from your shoulders, but um, you know, you'd be surprised at how many people now, thankfully, in, in the, you know, uh, as be- awareness grows that people are more accepting of it. And it's not as uh, big a stigma to talk about poop or your, you know, all these symptoms and things like that. Um, you know, and especially through social media now, it's so easy to reach out to, to Sydney or other people that with IBD or, you know, things that are on their page, you can send a DM or a message and really ask for support. And I think um, the biggest thing for me, once I found out about it was, you know, the, the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation for me, there was support groups for, you know, young teens. There is uh Camp Oasis, uh, I know in, in Illinois, there's a chapter with Wisconsin. Uh, it's a summer camp for kids that, you know, the, the, the cool thing about it is, you know, to be in the cool kids club, you have to have some kind of IBD. So I, um, I've been uh, giving time and volunteering there for like the last 12 years and to see kids, you know, ranges from, you know, eight to 14, 15, who've never met anyone uh, with Crohn's or an ostomy and all of a sudden now be surrounded by a whole camp of kids and, and, and adults and volunteers with similar illnesses and uh, histories, just to see uh, kids be open about their disease makes a huge difference. Not only that week, but you know, for, for years and years to come, they have that support system, uh, unlike anyone else. You know, you can you can go to your school counselor. You can go to, you know, uh, a, a counselor uh, on your own. But to have something specific that you can, uh, you know, support that you can talk with and another peers' uh, way to help cope and deal is to have someone around you uh, that you can talk to and be comfortable with. Thank you. Um, also, for like how the camps changed. Um, Ryan, so for your experience with camps, like sure. how that changed your own like internalization or how you see IBD? Yeah, I mean it's crazy. I I, I tell this story a lot because um, I was I was too old to be a camper by the time I found out. But uh, in my twenties, I started volunteering to be a uh, one of the counselors with the kids. Now, because of my mental health background, I am the uh, mental health director of our chapter. Uh, but some of those early years, uh, again, the, the best memory I have ever had, and, and at the moment, I didn't even know about this, this, this instance happening until someone told me about it after camp had ended. We we're down at the lakefront. Uh, it's hot. It's summer. It's, it's group swim time. Uh, and here I was with my ostomy and scars and, and just took my shirt off, went right in the water. Uh, un, unbeknownst to me, across from uh, the, the lake shore was a young boy who had, uh, I don't think he had an ostomy, but he had some scars and was really hesitant and like refusing to get into the water. And so his counselor at the time just happened to look up and see me uh, and pointed me out to this kid and was like, look, that's a that's counselor Ryan. You know, he's got an ostomy, he has scars, but look, like he's in the water and having fun no one's looking at him, no one's, you know, thinking he's weird or different. Uh, and, and so he ended up getting in the water. But again, I didn't even know that, that happened. I was like completely oblivious to having this impact on someone until after camp. Um, but yeah, that was, that, that was, you know, super life changing for me as uh, someone who an adult with Crohn's that had never really had experience with such a big group of IBD patients like a camp setting. Uh, and, and for me now as an adult, like it's the one week of, of the year I refuse to miss whether I'm working, uh, you know, my past life working, I would take vacation to go volunteer for a week with kids now being, uh, my boss, I'm, I'm flexible to take that time off. You know, unfortunately with COVID the last, uh, couple of years have been virtual. So now, uh, not only being kind of on the mental health side of it, but we go uh, any way that we can interact and help the kids uh, and all, you know, all of us talking on the panel tonight, I think we've all kind of had that one common thing, of just, you know, being open about it and, and realizing that, you know, it doesn't define you, but the sooner we have supports and, and, and healthy people around us to kind of reinforce those uh, beliefs in ourselves, uh, the better we, we're off kind of in the long run. Thanks, Ryan. And then I do want to wrap up. So just want to kind of leave it with 
on how IBD has most positively impacted your life. If there's anything you would want to go back and tell your younger self um, when you were just going through um, the whole like diagnostic period and um, anything you want to leave for our attendees or the people who will be watching our event later. I think one of the things that I wish I you know, could tell my younger self is that um, anything is still possible. I mean, it may not look the way you think it's going to, but, um, but that doesn't mean that it, you won't you know, be able to reach your goals. You may, you may, you know, you may have to change things or alter things, but that you, that, you know, it just because it, life isn't look the way you think it's supposed to look doesn't mean that it won't be a fulfilling and amazing life. And I've learned that through so many things, being a doc and being a parent and having IBD and taking care of families with chronic illness is, is, you know, you never know what life's going to bring you and you can find a way to still connect with people, connect, uh, you know, with others and, and make an impact in, in them. And I think sometimes like most of the other people said is, is you have, you realize how much you can connect and really help other people in your similar shoes. And I think that's been a huge, um, a huge thing for me is, is realizing what a difference we can all make in each other's lives um, just by shared experiences or even just by recognizing the support other people need, even if your experiences are different. I mean, you know, Sydney and Ryan, our experiences are different, but we have um, this understanding of what it's like to take this kind of rough journey. And so you can support people in any way. It doesn't have to be someone with IBD. You can understand that being ill in any way makes it hard and, and just being someone to listen. So I think it's, it, that's what it's impacted me has really taught me a lot how to, I think it's really helped me become a good doc and be a compassionate person. Yeah, I agree. And I love that the Crohn's and Colitis community is just so positive. And as soon as I meet someone or get a comment online from someone that says, oh, I have Crohn's, I have colitis, I just feel an instant connection to them because like you said, like we relate to each other. And it really did help me a lot to have friends that were also going through something similar as, as I was, because if you're talking to someone that's gone through it themselves, then it's just, it's different than talking to like a parent or someone that doesn't I exactly understand because they haven't gone through it themselves. And if I could tell my younger self something, I would say like, this is temporary. Your pain is not going to last forever. You're going to get through this. And um, IBD has positively impacted my life in so many ways. Like it's such a cliche, but like if, if someone would ask you like, would you wish that you never went through this? Like, no, I, I would not genuinely because it completely like ch changed my perspective on life and just to really not take anything for granted like I my whole life I was taking my good health for granted and I'm sure many other high school students young teens young adults feel the same way and after being in the hospital as much as I have now I'm just so grateful every day that I can wake up and do the things that I love and just be healthy and I think it's super important to remember how lucky you are yeah, I agree. I think that, I mean, I have way more positive things to say, be grateful for about having IBD than, than negative. I mean, yeah, we've talked about our journeys from start to finish at this point, but again, none of us would be here on this panel if it wasn't for IBD. And, and, and like Sydney said, I think we, you know, take for granted uh, a lot of the good times and having, you know, healthy, you know, um, bodies, you know, without having IBD, I think because of that, it makes us grateful for, uh, you know, the community that we have, our doctors, uh, because without them, we wouldn't, you know, be in, in healthy positions that we are today. I think one thing, you know, looking back, uh, or for some of the, for some of the, the viewers, it is really to just be to be open about your disease, open about you, open about your needs, whether it's uh, you know with family, it's it's your support system. I think those are the biggest things that have had a positive outlook uh, on my life is just being able to open up to loved ones and supports uh, because there's going to be bad days, and, and those are the people that really that know you the best uh, that are going to help you kind of get through those rough times. Um, and then you know also with you know with those relationships, whether it's in a, a dating situation or a friendship or a work relationship, you know, if, if people aren't accepting of your story or your symptoms uh, or, or who you are uh, as an IBD patient, you know, I've just kind of taken uh, the approach, well then, 
you know what, then it's your loss. I, you know, I don't need you in my life. Or, you know, let's say if it's a dating relationship or a friendship, if someone's not okay with a part of you that doesn't define you, that's just a part of you, uh, your hair color, your tattoos, whatever it is, like, you know, then that, that's their problem and not my problem. And so I think that's something that's taken me a long time to realize as I've grown older and also as an IBD patient is, um, you know, people can be mean, people can be judgmental, but ultimately, you know, as long as I'm making good decisions and I'm comfortable with myself and what I'm doing, you know, other people's opinions really don't matter. Well said. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you everyone for all the positivity you shared tonight and just sharing your stories. And I'm sure everyone connected in some way and are very interested in what you've had to say tonight. So thank you. And then, um, so we're gonna go past the Q and A just cause we are running over time. But if you have any questions, feel free to email me at this email address. It's ibdcenter at stanfordchildrens.org. And I could always pass them on to our panelists if they're okay to answer the questions <laughs> um, just because we are short on time. And um, also just wanted to quick give a shout out to um, for Improved Care Now. So like what Ryan was saying and how he really felt that community with um, going to the Camp Oasis. Um, Improved Care Now does have different ways for um, patients to like get involved or for parents to get involved and to meet others who are going through similar experiences. So one way is the PAC, um, the Patient Advisory Council for Teens. Um, and then so feel free to go back later on or take um, your cameras out on your phones and use the QR codes to be directed to the pages. But with, that's it for tonight. So thank you all for attending. And um, we will be having the recording posted on our website at a later date. So thank you. Thanks for having us, Nicole. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah.